Welcome to fault number six. Um, my name is Ivan Habernal. I'm giving guest lectures today and there will be and there will be another two guest lectures in January from me. So I'm very happy to be here virtually and thanks for Stefan for inviting me. We'll be covering today some pretty uh, low level text processing in Python and there will be some exercising, uh, exercises doing coding through this uh, lecture. So let's start. So as usual, there is a chapter in the book according to, to our today's lecture and you might want to read it in advance or you don't have to do that and just watch this video. So where are we now on the landscape of this course is still sort of at the beginning. So we'll be dealing with the data part of natural language processing. We will be dealing with raw data and different ways how to get these texts. So after watching this lesson, uh, you should be able to, to process some uh, natural language data or natural language text either from your local files, files or by downloading from existing corpora or just get some raw data from the internet and clean it up a little bit for, for the processing. So here is what a typical NLP pipeline might look like. So we get some very dirty data either from the internet in form of HTML or some local files or some corpora. And since these data are uh, data sets are dirty, uh, we want to clean them up and then apply some pre-processing and then later on put it forward to some other task we're interested in, like building vocabularies or doing some classification on top of that. So let's move on to, first exam to the first example where we get some data from the existing uh, Gutenberg corpus. So NLTK does contain a small portion of the Gutenberg collection and the files are located online. So now we will jump to uh, to PyCharm and try to do this exercise first. So you see, you know how um, how you can experiment with NLTK to get the data and play around with that and understand a little bit of the behavior of NLTK by doing. So here I have a PyCharm. I strongly recommend you to to work with some uh, IDEs such as PyCharm. Or I don't know what are the others. It's still better than doing just Jupyter notebooks or on the command line because you have you know the advantage of having full-fledged um, integrated development environment. So you have com uh, code completion, help, and other cool stuff. Uh, and PyCharm is also available as a as a community edition for free. So it's open source. Highly recommended for any serious work with Python. So what I have here is the project. Um, I have some libraries here imported for the project in terms of requirements. Um, I'll put this code on, on, on GitHub later so you can check how to basically prepare your environment and install all these dependencies. But we'll be using NLTK and some other libraries, um, which I'll show just in a minute. So we start with uh, getting one file, one TXT file from the Gutenberg corpus. And for that, we need um, you are a li li library for downloading files over HTTP. So let's do this from your lib requests, import URL open. And what is our URL? Um, so it's from the Gutenberg um, .org, files 2554, 2554, I guess 0txt. I have it written somewhere, so I don't remember it by heart. And then what we do is get um, uh, the raw data by calling URL open. So we will be calling URL open where we just need a URL. And then there's a function read, which gives me the data. So what I'm gonna do is now is print. I'm interested what type of the data it is. So print type uh, raw. I'm gonna run this code. So there's a shortcut for everything. I'll just first press run here. And um, so how can I run it now? Run this code. So it's showing me the console here. And now it's only the data. And it says that the raw data is, um, is bytes. 
Okay, so what I need more now is maybe to show how long it is. So print, okay, type, okay, length of the raw data. I'm calling control shift um, F10. So it's reading the data again from the internet and saying, oh, it's uh, one megabyte long. And if I'm interested in what is there, so I'm gonna print the first, let's say, um, 90 bytes. So now there's a typo here, print 90 bytes. So I'm running again, downloading any from the internet and it's showing, oh, okay, it's showing the content here, but it could be inter it's interesting here. What is, what are these three, three guys doing here? So this is saying that the file is a Unicode file and these are so-called uh, BO, BOM, I guess. This byte order mark, exactly. And it's saying me that there is some encoding of this, um, of this file that I need to take into account when I'm converting this to string. So um, this is it. And let's move on. So let's go back to the slides. So this is basically what we are just showing here, downloading the, the file and printing some raw text out of it. Okay, so what can we do with that? Mm, we're just given um, a stream of text, but for for the processing, we would be interested in uh, splitting that into actual words. So this is a long string, and we would like to have it in words and split also the punctuations, uh, dots, dashes, commas, and so on. And this process is called tokenization. So we split a long string into a list of tokens. So there's an LTK function doing that, which is called word tokenize, and we'll have a look into that uh, right away. So we're gonna work with the very same file we had before uh, from the Gutenberg corpus. So I'm gonna just copy paste the reading the, uh, reading the same file through URL. So that's what we saw before. The only difference here is that I'm importing NLTK already. Uh, but the one thing, so what we saw before is this, the, the BOM characters at the beginning. So the, the raw bytes are in, um, in so-called Unicode encoding and we want to convert them to, uh, to actual string in Python. So the method we're going to do, going to call is, uh, call raw decode and we have to specify the, the encoding of the file and because of the BOM uh, beginning of the file we have to find out on Wikipedia or somewhere that it corresponds to UTF-8 but um, with this flag SIG so this will be our decoded file uh, decoded string and we can just have a look that um, what we are actually getting is now without the, the first BOM character, so it's a clean text. Okay, so now we see a clean text. Also, if we ask which type is that, the code it is already a Python string. So let's have a look. <clears throat> So we see this is a string already. Good, so we are talking about a tokenization. So we want to uh, split this text into actual tokens, uh, actual words, which we call tokens. And for that, we need to, um, to have the capability of NLTK downloaded locally. So before you first run this code for tokenization, you need to make sure that you, uh, that you have your code available. So it's calling by um, NLTK download this thing. If you don't run this uh, this code, uh, then any organization will fail, and it will show you how how that you have to actually call, call this function to download the code. So you have to do it only once forever for your local installation of NLTK. I'll keep it here. It's fine. It doesn't take very long. And then I can create tokens by tokenizing. So I'm going to call tell NLTK. And uh, I'm gonna call word tokenize um, on the decoded text. Okay, so let's see. It's downloading again, saying a string, and now it's saying it's downloading the uh, the package punct punctuation, and it's up to date, so that's fine. 
I tokenize a string, but I didn't put, print anything. So <laughs> let me let me print the tokens. So I guess it's now a list. So let's do the first ten items of the list and let's have them printed. Again, downloading the file string, blah blah blah. And as we see, so we get a list of the words and the punctuation as well. So you know here. Um, by splitting by uh, by a space, it's quite easy. By splitting by the comma and so on and so forth, it can do better. You know, it can do more complicated stuff, such as splitting the dates correctly and so on. So let's move back to the presentation, and here's again repeating what we just did. So there is another class in uh, in NLTK for the project Gutenberg, which is very handy for working with text and it's called NLTK text. So it gives more information such as some, uh, you know, some metadata. So let's have a closer look in the code. We're going to use the very same file. So I'll just copy paste the previous, you know, getting the tokens. So uh, I'm going to use, um, okay. That's on the one liner, but I'm gonna use again the imports, NLTK, and decoding the tokens, um, tokenize the decoded text. Okay, so then I'm gonna create a class. So text is going to be NLTK text, and it needs the tokens. So I'm gonna add the tokens, and then I can, so the text, I can index the class text. Uh, and access the actual tokens. So let's do, for example, print text. And now I can index some of the tokens of the text class, such as um, 26 up to 1042. So let's see. Again, it's only the text from the internet, uh, doing encoding, tokenization, and then it's printing the tokens from the text. What I can also do is, for example, show some um, some typical connection of words, some typical word groups, which are called collocations. So NLTK or the text class in particular has a support for doing collocations right away. So I'm gonna print text collocations and collocations do need um, uh, stop words. So stop words are like words like A, V, and so on. So very typical words. Uh, and the stop words are filtered out before computing the collocation. So in order to to run this smoothly, we need to, as with the, the previous tokenization, we have to make sure that we run this method for downloading stop words first. I had it already, so I didn't have to run it here. But if you want to run these collocations from scratch, you have to make sure that you don't load the stop words. And what the collocations are here, it's interesting. So we see it's picking up the, you know, uh, actual names, Katarina. <laughs> okay, so it's a Russian uh, literature and great deal, young man, and so on. So typical, you know, multi word expressions of size two that are found in the, in the corpus. Very handy. So this is what we just saw. And let's move on. I'm not going to code this, but we have... Um, so there has to be some cleaning when we work with the Gutenberg corpus because there is some metadata starting at the beginning, you know, metadata at the beginning of the file, and we want to locate them and clean them before working with the actual data in there. And for doing so, for finding, you know, this title uh, part one and the end end of Project Gutenberg crime, we uh, we are using here the find function in the raw text or regular expressions can be useful as well, but we'll get to that later on. So this closes up like very basic stuff on, on downloading a, a data from the Gutenberg corpus or TXT file from the Gutenberg corpora and we'll move on to something much more um, complicated, which is getting text from H HTML for websites. 
Okay, we're moving on to dealing with HTML, which is the, the language of the internet, so to say. So it's another data source and typically will be some sometime we'll be dealing with HTML or web pages as a data source for NLP processing. So dealing with HTML comes with a um, little bit of burden of the processing or the cleaning because it's sort of not a plain text it's some structural language so let's let's have a short look so we're gonna scrape it's called scraping we're gonna scrape uh, a page and we're gonna have a look what's inside so again we need request so from url request import url open and then let's download again a raw html which is going to be you're open some let's say wikipedia page so in wikipedia uh, let's say python and we're gonna read it and let's see what's in there uh, well just print some first 400 bytes of of it so i'm gonna run it Oh, okay, name, not know what's going, what's going wrong here? Oh, of course. All right, so we see, well, this is far from being, uh, being a text, so we will have to deal somehow with that. Uh, we need to first convert to string from the raw bytes. So um, we already know the methods, so the HTML is going to be raw html decode utf8 and now html again first 100 characters will show us uh, actually a nicely aligned html but that's just the beginning so what we have to do is uh, to clean the structural elements from the text mm, by a library, for example, by Beautiful Soup. So again, this was our were our first experiments with HTML. So let's move on to Beautiful Soup, and again, let's jump straight to the code and just play around with that and try it out. So what I have here in the code already, um, I installed a library through the dependencies specifying this, you know, requirements txt. Uh, so you you might want to make sure that you have this library uh, installed through your pip or package manager. And I'm using the latest version, so it's always better to specify the exact version of everything you're using because if you want to reuse it two years two years later. Um, there might be some changes in the libraries and you want to make sure that you're using the very same version and nothing breaks. So anyway, let's try importing beautiful soup. So I'm going to use again the um, URL requests, uh, URL open, then um, I'm going to need, I guess, an LTK again. And I'm going to import beautiful soup now. So from BS4 import the class beautiful soup. Okay, so I'm going to download again um, an HTML text from the internet. Uh, I decided for um, a page from the TU Darmstadt site because it's very simple uh, HTML. So I'm just going to copy paste it from, from here. So this is, you know, this long uh, URL. And I'm gonna read it. And here I can simply instantiate a beautiful soup. So I'm gonna say create a new class beautiful soup, which basically needs you know I can put the raw HTML as well there, so uh, it will work out of box. I just will tell that it has some features, and the features will be html5 flip which is the decoder of beautiful soup you know if you don't put these features there it won't break but it will be complaining about missing specifying the html parser so it's better to put it there and since i want text i just here call and get text so okay let's see let's see what's in the text so first 100 characters 
let's run it. Okay, so it seems like, <laughs> welcome, a text extracted from the ugly HTML and now we might want to, for example, parse it um, or tokenize it with um, NLTK. So I'm gonna comment this out and I'm gonna do NLTK token, um, sorry, word tokenize and now the text and it's gonna be token so you might be you, know, you might not have noticed i'm using some very helpful shortcuts here in pycharm for example for creating new uh, new uh, variables here so it's control alt v and other auto completion like i print and then it's just suggesting what i should write so tokens and then you know first let's say 150 tokens another shortcut control shift f10 again for running the code so it's really handy if you're uh, if you're using your uh, environment for coding to learn some of the shortcuts to make your make your more efficient anyway so what we got here is Oh, it seems like first 150 tokens from the side of TU Darmstadt. So, well, we can see since its foundation in 1897, uh, TU Darmstadt, and so on, so on, so on. So, it seems, it looks much better than very ugly HTML, you know, markup language. So, now we have sort of, sort of text we can start doing NLP with. So Beautiful Soup is a very powerful framework for dealing with various sorts of HTML. I'm pretty sure if you will ever work with um, applied NLP with some sort of data or scraping data, you will come across Beautiful Soup again. So it's really, you know, keep that in mind. It's a very useful library. Well, we have different sources. We have another sources on the internet, uh, for example, um, the RSS feeds. So we might be parsing them as well. So, you know, RSS feeds are structured sort of XML sources of data. And there's all on, again, libraries for doing that. So let's jump into the code and try it out. So for processing RSS feeds, um, there's again a library and again, with as with Beautiful Soup, I already put it into the requirements and install it. So the library I'm using is called Feed Parser and I'm specifying this actual version, but I, I've already installed through pip in my local environment so I can just go ahead and try it out. So I'm going to import this Feed Parser. So Feed Parser then I'm going to use um, beautiful soup again. So I'm going to import beautiful soup. I'm going to import word token as well. Actually, I import a full NLTK. And then I'm going to uh, I'm going to download or parse one special you know, XML feed, which I have specified here. So I'm going to parse this URL, so we call it, well, let's call it feed atom. Okay, why not? It's a string. And I'm gonna call feed parser mm, parse, and I need to specify this URL. So, what was the name? Feed atom. All right, so it's um, this feed, it's, um, it's a block on, on language, so let's call it language language lock and let's have a look what we have there so first would be interesting to see what is what's the output of this function so what's the type let's try it out print type lang long and let's run it it's taking some time okay so it's some um, oh feed parser dict hmm I have never seen this before, so maybe we can, you know, explore this class by, you know, saying PyCharm that we want to make sure that, you know, this slang lock is this actual type because Python has, you know, it's not strongly type language, you know, you can change types as you go. So let's do this. Let's say we want to make sure that, that our lang lock is of type feed parser dict. Oh, and now it's complaining that it doesn't know feed parser dict. So I'm gonna press Alt Enter 
and say, well, okay, I'm gonna, I want to import this class so PyCharm knows what I'm talking about. So you see it automatically imported feed parser dict. Okay, so now PyCharm knows this is this class. If I run this, this assert will make sure that it won't fail and this is the actual class I'm getting. Let's try it out actually, why not? So I'm running that and it shouldn't fail. If it fails, I did something wrong. Okay, it didn't fail, very good. And now, since PyCharm knows which type of the link lock it is, it's supposed to be, I can just, you know, let show all the methods of, uh, of that thing. And it seems it's an extension of, of a dictionary. Okay, interesting. I can put items, retrieve items. So since it's a dictionary, maybe I can, you know, look at the keys. So what are the keys of this thing? So um, you see, I'm exploring as I go because I don't know this class. I could look up in the in the documentation, but maybe you know I just want to do it interactively. So what are the keys? Entries, feed, headers. Okay, feed sounds interesting. So let's have a look. I'm gonna I'm gonna print again length lock feed and let's see what that is. So it's still downloading from the internet, you know, I could have a local copy. Oh, okay, it's another, it seems like it's another dictionary and there's a title. Okay, cool. So let's print the title of this uh, RSS channel, of this atom feed. And the title is, voila, language lock. Hmm, yeah, not really funny. Anyway, so <laughs> we see I guess we saw before that we have these some entries, so language log, say to the entries and take the second one or the third, sorry, take the third one and it's going to be our post. And maybe you just print the post title. Let's try it out. Okay, so this is the title. And also we have the content of that. So let's try post content. So I'm navigating here. I'm navigating here through dictionary. So you can do both things. So you can do like post content is the key of the dictionary. But in Python, you can do this as well. Like calling, you know, calling a method on this object. It really depends, you know. I mean, this is, this is clear because you know that this is a dictionary and you're picking up the key while the other the other one could be just a method and it might be not really that clear in the first glance. But anyway, so we have the content and we're gonna call it content. That should work, right? Okay. And now we pass the content to beautiful soup and get, you know, beautiful plain text out of it. So let's say beautiful soup and here the content. Again, the features will be uh, okay. HTML five parser. Why not? And get text as a method. And now we tokenize the text. So we import it. NLTK word tokenize uh, raw text and get just the first twenty words. So let's see. It should be working. Oh, there is something wrong. Feature not found. HTML5 parser. Hmm. Okay, maybe I did something wrong. Just let, let's try it without anything. So there could be some warning from Beautiful Soup. Okay, a not list. Uh, content. Okay, so it seems like the content is a list. You know, sometimes these libraries just you need to look up in the, you know, um, in the documentation of these libraries, what is actually there, just trying out by uh, tri trial and error. If you don't know these libraries well, as I do like now. Okay, this is really a disaster. Maybe we just need a value here. Uh, good. Now it needs the features HTML lib. So let's edit there. like that. So good, we have the tokens. 
as you just saw, it was really like trial and error to you know to figure out what the library for parsing RSS is you know offering us to get a clear text. And since sometimes the the actual structure of the objects is not clear, either from documentation or you know from the actual values you're getting, you might want to experiment. So sometimes you know the disadvantage of Python is also the advantage, but disadvantage could be that sometimes you don't know what these objects are. Is it a list or is it a dictionary or is it a, an array or I don't know, it's just a string value. So you wanna you wanna just try it out. And, uh, or look up in the documentation or just try it out and figure out what is there. Sometimes it's very easy. So this covered basically the main processing of RSS feeds. Uh, I think RSS is still useful for blogs and many you know, blogging sites do publish in RSS. Uh, it might be getting out of, you know, out of fame a little bit. Uh, because of other channels like social media, Facebook, and so on, which we don't cover here. But it's still a useful feature to get some um, some raw text data from the internet. So, which brings us to the end of the second part, where we were discussing of getting HTML or RSS feeds from the internet. And now, in the next part, we're going to move to processing local files. So we are moving on to processing local files, files which you want to do NLP over and you have them stored on your hard disk. I have to say I, I have been enjoying, enjoying coding here in PyCharm, but um, I won't continue that for the, for the full lecture. I strongly encourage you just to, you know, to pick up your favorite uh, IDE such as PyCharm or anything else which you prefer. And just playing around and try everything and explore you know, the capabilities of NLTK and Python. So let's move on and try uh, accessing local files. You can do that by calling a Python function open where you specify your document and it will open uh, the file in the read mode and you can read a file and what you will get is um, if you print it oh this is actually a two point you know two version of uh, python because it should be print with parentheses you know so don't do this just print with parentheses nevertheless <laughs> it will print out a text you were just you you read from your file where this uh, backslash n is the new line character and of course, you just don't want to read one line. You want to read it in, you know, all the lines. So you run uh, in the loop for each line in in this uh, placeholder, which is this f. And you want to print a uh, line where strip is getting rid of the uh, the extra white spaces, you know, on the on the borders of each line, such as uh, the backslash n character. And you don't want to only read files, you want to also write into the files locally. So the same function open where you specify your open file and just set a flag to w that is saying Python you want to write. And then here this is, uh, we're just getting a set of words from NLTK corpus then again is this words. So we're getting, this is basically creating a set of words. And for each word in this set of words, which we want to sort alphabetically, we print to this file uh, a word. So basically it's a word per line. And exactly, this is going to be the, the flag, which is important because if you just call open without a flag, it's for read. And also we cannot forget about closing the stream at the end. So we want to call output file close and it will close the open handler of the file. Another possible input for text is just you, you let interactively people type in, you know, to the command line. It's, just, it's very old school thing. So you don't really see it nowadays. You know, people were, people basically would fill in uh, web forms or, you know, chats or whatever but you can really read from the standard input where you call this function input and then the prompt and if you were run this on the command line 
you would see the prompt and then you enter some text, press enter and you get it into this variable s. And you can work with this variable s with anything else, you know, you might prefer. So might be sometimes handy if you really want to do very small console based application. You have been, uh, you have learned something about different corpora in the, in the previous lecture, uh, one of the previous lecture, I guess. And, you know, so not all corporas are in the same format. So, you know, one corpus could be a plain text file, one corpus could be in sort of semi-structured file and they vary. So NLTK, you know, we can read different corpora under the same umbrella of, you know, having the same access to that having the same interface, so to say, and this is where we have these different corpus readers. So we can have like categorized plain text corpus reader or just simple plain text corpus reader. So it might be very useful functionality if you want to reuse your corpus, which is stored locally. So it was just a short introduction to different, you know, types of reading local files, either very simple reopening uh, a reading from a file and writing into the file or getting from the input from the command line or there is another functionality for dealing with complex corporas like corpus readers and it wraps up our you know very short introduction and we'll be moving on to something very let's say low level which is dealing with strings in python okay here we go for strings very low level processing in python so you might know it already and you can feel free to skip it or fast forward. So as you know, strings are um, bound into um, you know single quote or, or parenthesis and you have to escape them if they appear in the text. So, you know, there should be no surprise in this slide. If you don't understand anything, just, you know, go and try playing around with strings in Python. Should be very straightforward. And the same for multi-line strings, we have just using, we are using three apostrophes. I think I made a mistake, I said parenthesis, so it's apostrophes. So three apostrophes, then you can have like multi-line, uh, multi-line string. Some very basic operation with strings, it's just concatenates a couple of strings. So, you know, you type a plus and you can multiply by an integer and it will just concatenate number of times. Strings behave as uh, as lists as well, so we can access each individual characters in the list in the in the string. So, for example, if we have this uh, Monty Python string by you know accessing the index zero, we get a first letter and so on. So it's very same as as lists are in Python, and we can use negative indexes uh, indices indexes, where we say like minus one is the very last character. Um, and the same is for uh, getting slices of strings. So it's the same as with um, as with lists in Python. So you just you know type in the first um, the first index, which is going to be here. Let's say six to ten, gonna be six, so zero, so the sixth including, and ten exclusive. So it's inclusive, exclusive. The ten is not going to be there. So you get Python here if you type that in. Well, I, I suggest like remember and you know, playing around with that and remember by some give you know having a good example that it's inclusive and exclusive and well sometimes you just you can make a mistake um, but try to remember that. If you want to find out whether a string is contained in another string, it, there is just a you know a nice functionality in Python for testing you know this in operator. So you say think in phrase is true and is it true and blah 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 some think so it should be true okay and you know we're saying we found this it's very handy and there's a bunch of other functionalities for manipulating strings like finding from right hand side finding an index of occurrence or you know changing to lowercase uppercase replacing text and so on. So I would just suggest, you know, to try these by playing around again with Python and to see how they behave and what they do. 
We're moving to, to an important aspect which we already noticed when processing the HTML files. This is working with encoding uh, text. So we, if we read a file binary, even though you know, regardless of what it contains, it, gets, it gives us bytes, so a string of bytes. If the plain text is in ASCII, ASCII, then uh, we have one-to-one -one basically mapping from a character to byte. And if we are going, you know, a file, if we move beyond ASCII to, for example, Unicode or UTF-8 and so on, different encodings, uh, so each character can have different length in terms of bytes. You know, in ASCII, each byte is one character. In Unico and so on, they have different sizes and really depends on the encoding. So we want we have to make sure that that we know the encoding. If we reading a, a text which is in a, in a byte stream, that we know the encoding of the input to convert to to the text properly. So here uh, we see the ASCII table. Uh, the, the purpose is not to to scare you off by just to show that there is a correspondence of so it's in hexadecimal so the code would be uh, for example uh, 61 it's not 61 it's in hexadecimal so we need to convert it decimal but never mind i mean the, the, it's number up until from 0 to 128 and a is here as one byte and um, corresponds to one character so I guess the capital A is 65 in, in decimal. I mean, you can look it up if you really need. But here this is more interesting because it's showing that there's different encodings for you know different types of text in Python. Uh, for example, you know the first 256, so ASCII times two characters is just a byte, as we just saw, because byte fits into 256. Um, and then we have two different, you know, Unicode ranges and up to four billion characters. So I, you know, here are all the emojis and, you know, and uh, the extended uh, accents for various characters. And in four billion characters, we have, you know, the Klingon as well, I guess. I'm not sure about it. Anyway, so the normal strings are a uh, type of string, are Unicode and they could be represented internally and differently but then if we want to write it to to the output or read it from from input read it from the external file or some external source we get bytes and we know we have to know what um, what encoding the bytes are so whether this is utf-8 or some iso standard they have different encoding here in bytes for for the accents so we have um, methods here for changing for encoding and decoding as we basically we saw it already when we were dealing with the html text from you know from the internet it, which one of the one of them was in so the html was in UT, utf8 and the other one was uh, the uh, the txt was utf8 sig with you know boem at the beginning so we have these methods for decode and encode so it's converting from bytes to string and vice versa. So these are very useful methods. And many times you see like there's, you know, if there's something wrong with the raw text, with the text after cleaning up, you will, you might find out like, oh, actually instead of uh, eh, I see something very strange. So it might be because the, the encoding uh, was wrong or the, the, the you know, we didn't really we didn't really know what type of the file it is and which encoding and maybe the conversion was wrong because we just didn't specify the correct encoding of the bytes another very powerful tool for dealing with strings is regular expression because regular expression allows you to matching patterns and and do some search basically in a text or matching some pattern in a in a text so how exactly it works is so the motivation here is that we want to many times find some matches, for example, a text which is ending, uh, which is in past, past perfect, uh, ending with ed, and we want to do it much smarter than just, you know, calling ends with on every token. So this is where regular expression comes with their, you know, expressivity mm, to help us. 
So what you need for that in Python is the RE module. And here we're just preparing a list of words from one of the corpora in NLTK, which is the uh, chat word. So here we are building a sorted vocabulary, basically. It's nothing, uh, nothing surprising. And we will be working with this um, later on. So here is this example of uh, finding words ending with ed using regular expressions. So what we do here um, is that we iterate through the word list and if the word from the word list is matching this regular expression, we will, uh, we will keep it in this list basically. So it's a list comprehension in Python. But the most important part is here. This is the, the, the pattern which is matching a text and it's saying ed and the dollar sign and the dollar sign is a special symbol uh, representing the end of the string you know so as you can see all these strings all the words that ending in ed are matching and they're they ended up in this uh, in this list we comprehend it and other symbols that are important in pattern matching in regular expression and i'm i'm pretty sure you know some of them at least you know is uh, is a dot which is uh, which stays for any single character then um, the head here which is which is matching the opposite of the of the dollar sign so this is the end of the text and this is the begin beginning of the text so here this pattern would read as okay beginning of the text then any character any character then j any character any character t any character any character uh, dollar sign so what comes out here is a list of letters that a list of words that match these this regular expression and last but not least is the um, the question mark character which is saying the previous character in the regular expression is optional so it could or doesn't have to doesn't have to appear so for example this regular expression e minus mail will match both email and e minus or dash mail what is also very powerful are closures uh, which are so in contrast to the question mark it allows more characters to appear so we have plus and so-called clean star so star where plus is saying that uh, one or more occurrences of the previous character uh, should be matched so for example here this regular expression says that m must appear at least once or multiple times and the same for i and n and e so of course it will match m i and e which is mine here so we have at least one occurrence but you know it will also match the um, the other words here because we have one one and more repeats of the of each of the characters. In contrast, uh, star also allows for um, zero occurrences of the character, so it's optional up to n occurrences. So here, if we say m might appear or might not, I might not appear or can appear any any times. So it will match empty string because none of these has to appear at all and it will match all of the others so it's more powerful right you know you can write very complicated regular expression because there are much more meta characters you can use so one of them is a group so um, these brackets and this is saying that um, either of these characters cannot cannot appear at least once so this will match all words where neither of these letters appear and of course if we want to match some of these meta characters i mean if we want to match uh, an occurrence of a dot for example the dot has a special meaning as we just saw dot is any character so we have to escape it with backslash we can go more crazy by, you know, we have a, a question mark, we have plus and we have um, the star for multiple occurrences. 
Well, we can also specify the range of how many occurrences of the word there could be. So A and then the, the lowest range and highest range will match A, 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 triple A up to four A's. Oh, I'm sorry, not four A's anymore. So you can be you know, much more precise. And if you want to create um, a different branching of the pattern matching, we will use pipe here. So this regular expression, so we can decide whether we accept AI or E or OO, and it will match all these three words. So now you might be wondering, okay, well, I want to match, for example, a date. So how can I do that with all which I've seen so far? So you can either enumerate um, for dates or numbers, you can enumerate, you know, zero to, to nine or create this range as a group. But we have also classes that already, you know, somebody was thinking about these use cases and we have classes of characters. So for example, for any, uh, any, digit we have the backslash d class then we have for strings or white space i mean maybe more important is white, white space characters so we have um small s and then non-white space characters we have capital s s so for example for matching words and maybe for splitting words these could be uh, very helpful and, you know, I would suggest just uh, play around with pattern matching and try out what you can do. So it's a very powerful tool. It has it corresponds to uh, languages, I guess, type three regular languages, right branching. So, you, you know, you can convert regular expression to a finite automata and there are, they correspond to, um, to a type of uh, formal languages. So it's very powerful. And I just suggest you just start to play around and see um, how useful these could be. So here we have a one particular use case where a regular expression can be used for, for example, if we want to build a search functionality and over, you know, we, we have these keywords and we want to make sure that no matter, you know, if we type in laptops or laptop, we, we always get um, the laptop for search, something which we call stemming. So we're, you know, ripping of the, uh, ripping of parts of, you know, the endings of the word, and we just get um, the so-called stem here of the word. So stem is not really like linguistically defined. There are different ones we'll we just come to in a, in a minute, but, you know, in, in search uh, information retrieval, it's quite, you know, quite a handy terminology using stems and stemming. So here, we have a regular expression of um, various endings of words which we just want to get rid of. And using this find all functionality here, we get a regular expression. We're um, replacing, you know, we're finding these occurrences. So for example, in processing, we would match it with ing here and this function would return ing. Well, this is not what we wanted, you know, for stemming, we're not interested in the ING, we're interested in what's what's before. So this is where a question mark and colon comes into, comes into question, where we would say, well, okay, I don't, I'm not interested in returning the, the matched part, but I'm interested in what's coming before, so in the word. So if I type here question mark and colon, I will get, oh, I will, yes, exactly. I will get a full word ending and this ing. For finding the actual word or the stem uh, or something linguistically motivated, which is lemma, we will come back um, in a couple of slides. Here's one example of using groups with their names for matching patterns of, um, of, a, of a name of a person. So. We want to find a first name and a second name from this text, for example. So this, this would be the first name, this would be the surname. And the regular expression could be what we have here is a group. So we have two groups and the groups consist of, so this is the um, a class character, which is, as we just saw in the table a couple of slides before, is a um, non-white space. So it's a um, you know, al alphabetic character and there has to be at least one occurrence of that. So this would match basically, you know, this word because then there's a 
white space, so this would be this white space, and then the last name. And we want to give it a name, so we say, okay, this group has a name. <coughs> Excuse me. This group um, has a name, and we put a name here by this p prefix and put the name of the group here. So then later on, when we match or when we call the match function, we can access it through the group function and call just uh, the group name and get the actual result. Now we're coming back to actually finding word stems. So we saw that before. Uh, so we, we had this uh, regular expression already. So these are the suffixes which we want to get rid of. Here we are adding the... Um, so any character, any times matching. So it would find our... So it would return two groups and one is... Because it's in parentheses, so one group would be, would be the stem and the second group would be the matching here, the ending, so one of these suffixes. However, this clean star is, is greedy. So greedy means it just continues to eat as much of the text as it can. So if we want to you know, find a stem of processes, and we have this S here, so, and we have ES here, but we have S here, the, the pattern matching will just eat the word up until it can, unless it sees something from here, unless it sees the, the S and ending. So we would end up with something which is process C and the ending S, because the greedy is eating up until it can't anymore, unless it fits one of these. If we want to do it non-greedy, then we would have to add this question mark here. So with a question mark, says the, the pattern matcher, okay, go through that unless you cannot match, unless you can match one of the suffixes. So it goes through process and then it can match ES already. So it says, okay, I'm stopping here the, this pattern matching and I'm just taking one of these, which is ES. So, you know, these could be tricky in some cases, but just remember greedy and non-greedy eating of clean star might make a difference quite substantially in some use cases. So we're continuing to build our stemmer and one step we need to consider is that if you want to, well, maybe there is no suffix we want to get rid of. So maybe the word is already the stemmed version. For example, the word language, well, there is nothing much we can get rid of, you know, because language is just the dilemma word, it's a dictionary word, so there is no suffix. So what we can do here is that we would in the in the previous version we had it had to it has to match one of these suffixes. But now we're adding you know question mark, and as you already know, question mark says that whatever comes before is optional. So it caters for the cases where there is no suffix and it will match also language and return language and then there is no suffix. So this is the proper functionality basically. And then if we build everything up into one, you know, let's say function that would uh, be defined as stem and then we put the word as a parameter, we would have the very same regular expression here and we would build a function for returning the stem and the suffix and uh, this could be for example you know process and es and of course we are interested in the stem not in the suffix so the function would return the stem what we just built was a very simple regular based uh, regular expression based stemmer there are, you know, stemmers could be more complicated functions. So one of the very famous stemmers and actually very well performing in many situations is the Porter stemmer, which is shipped with uh, along along with many different software packages, S and LTK or others for search. And as you see, we're not gonna go through the details here, but you can see, you know, the functionality of the stemmer could be much more much more complicated and in this case, this is still deterministic. So, uh, you know, you can build very easily based on regular expression and some branching of decision to be made, you can build a pretty good stemmer. And since we have different implementations of, or different versions of stemmers, even for, for English, uh, here we see a quick comparison of two stemmers 
from NLTK. So one is the Porter stemmer I just showed in the previous slide and the other is the Lancaster stemmer. And here we just see what happens if we, you know, if we have this token. So we tokenize this text using NLTK tokenizer, which we already know. And then each word will be stamped using one of these stemmers. And you can see, you know, the diff there are some differences which could be subtle or it could be very, you know, coarse grain. And it really depends on the use case where we want to use the stemmer, which one works best. So, you know, there is no golden rule of the best stemmer ever. Uh, you have to determine based on the application. So some of the stemmers are pretty aggressive and they're eating quite a lot. So, for example, here, Denise, which is a character from this quote, uh, we see both are actually fa failing here. They cannot recognize this as a person and they shouldn't stem it somehow. Although, as I said, the, the stem is not linguistically defined well. So, you know, there's some uh, floating definitions of that, so to say. So, Denny could be fine for pattern matching or in search. But then here we see Dan is perhaps too, ha too harsh. You know, it's really, it's taking a lot of the word. And, and so on. So you ma might want to have a look and, and try different stemmers which are shipped along uh, with NLTK. So that would be everything for, for now for uh, pattern matching and regular expression and a little bit of stemmers. So pattern matching, very powerful tool, not only in Python and natural language processing, but for any sort of programming. So, you know, regular expressions are used for example, in, in validation of web forms. So if you have to fill in a date, for example, in web form or some registration number, there's mostly there is some regular exp expression uh, checking this, validating or checking the validity of the, on the input field. So you wanna really master it. So stemming was one of the examples of normalization of text. So another normalization technique is just lower casing. So for example, here, well, we, we actually not, we're not interesting in the difference between D and D, one with capital T and one with a small t. So maybe we just want to normalize and treat both uh, the same way. And stemming is also one kind of normalization because we could have like, uh, you know, the past, past tense, um, decided and decide could be the same for um, in a search engine, for example. Another normalization technique, it more linguistically defined, is uh, is called lemmatization. And in lemmatization, we we want to match an occurrence or surface form of the word to its uh, dictionary uh, dictionary version, to its lemma. So for lemmatization in NLTK, we have uh, the WordNet lemmatizer, and it's matching the word or it's taking, you know, picking up the, the, the word if it's known in the, in the dictionary. So if we lemmatize a text we just saw before, we see, well, Dennis is correctly lemmatized. Listen, strange woman lying in pond and so on. So most of these are sort of, you know, the vocabulary version of words or so the base forms. But uh, for example, so for example here, woman is a single uh, while in the text we had women, so the plural. But lying, for example, is not uh, well lemmatized here because the lying is perhaps not in the, um, in the vocabulary of, of WordNet. So here we're, we have one com complex example of bringing many things together. Uh, so we had this class NLTK text for working with, corp with text in more, let's say, object-oriented way. And we had the rigor examples and we had the corpora. So what we are doing here is that we take this, this corpus NPS chat already and all these words and build uh, an instance of an LTK text class. So we have this chat object. And it comes with a functionality of uh, finding of pattern matching. So we would call find all and then add a regular expression. And in this regular expression, we are interested in, uh, in occurrence of three consecutive tokens or three consecutive words. And in our case, the words are delimited by these, um, these brackets. So we would be interested in, in uh, all occurrences of something, something bro as tokens. And if you run this on the NPS chat data set, it would find, for example, you rule bro, telling you bro, you twisted bro. Oh. All right. <laughs> 
pattern matching. Um, and we can use another functionality of uh, just what we just learned in, in regular expressions. So for example, limiting the length of, uh, of a token. So, you know, we have these parentheses here and we would say we accept everything, every, uh, every token starting with L, then anything comes and the minimum length would be three. So we could like lol, lol, lol. Um, okay, it's repeating three times. I'm sorry, it's occurrence of the tokens, not the length. Starting with L, so lol, lol, lol. L, blah, 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 and so on. So basically uh, a three consecutive token starting with L and then anything. So now when we know um, regular expressions and pattern matching, and we already saw tokenization in the very beginning of this lecture, you might be wondering, well, actually I can build a tokenizer, you know, splitting, the, splitting, a, sequen splitting a string into sequence of tokens. I can just build it myself, you know, it's, uh, it should be easy using just um, the special character classes, you know, white space and new line and tabulator and anything that should match my spaces, right? And that's true, you know, to some extent. So you would cover, let's say, I don't know, 90% of the tokenization would be, would be right. But there's, of course, you know, corner cases where you want to do better. So for example, in this text, uh, when Anna Duche and the apostrophes here and so on, so you want to really tokenize it into apostrophe here, then new token, and then here I would be one token, and this would be one token, and so on. So, you know, tokenization seems, you know, super trivial, but if you really want to do it right, it's actually pretty complicated. So that's why, for example, NLTK tokenizer, which we were using before, it's based on, on pattern matching, but it's much more, so to say, complicated. Uh, and it can really take care, it, it does take into account many of these, you know, strange things like, you know, USA poster print with dash here is one word, or, you know, prices, this is just one token and so on. So tokenization might be right tricky, quite tricky, especially on social media. So, you know, tokenizing Twitter, it's not that straightforward because this is not like a, you know, it's not a, a Britannica encyclopedia. It's written in a very informal way and it's hard to tokenize sometimes. Tokenization is, is an example of segmentation. So in segmentation, you want your splitting into smaller units and maybe you're not interested not only in, in words, but maybe also splitting into some higher units, let's say sentences. So NLTK offers um, a sentence segmenter which we need to, you know, to load load, load it from um, uh, from this file, and it's based on the punct punct library or punct pretrain model. Is it a model or is this regular expression? I'm not sure really, but it, there is a model shift with uh, NLTK, and it help us to split uh, the text into sentences. So in this example here, we take one text from the Gutenberg corpus. And we say, let we first tokenize a text, and then, uh, well, we tokenize it using this sentence tokenizer. So it's sentence segmenter. It should be called segmenter, but you know, with tokenizer and segmenter, it's really the only difference is you know how big the units are. So here we splitting into sentences, and as we see, here is an example of these sentences. So nonsense. It's a quote. So there's a next sentence. Quite nice. And there's next sentence here. So sentence splitting is really helpful in dealing with uh, large text, such as prose, or, you know, not really for social media or Twitter, where you rarely see a full sentence or even two of them. So for larger text, segmentation and sentences might be very useful in some use cases. So what, what have you learned today is that you know we saw how to load text either from the internet or from local files and we saw that in order to work with plain text we need to take care of getting rid of for example html or taking the text out of rss and then we saw that you know the devil lies in the details so we want to make sure that if we tokenize a text or make lemmatization or stemming 
we're using the right tools for the right task and there are some subtle differences which might influence anything we do just you know down the stream and we are also talking about a general concepts like uh, different encodings of files and they also play a role if you work with uh, non ascii text so if you work with german or you know any other non american you know non us let's say non english languages you know where you have um, uh, accents and so on so it's important to pay attention to to the encoding of the, of the files and we're also dealing with you know uh, regular expression and also with the bare bone string basically working with strings converting from one you know from bytes to strings and also selecting substrings and so on and why is this all important uh, well this is this is Typically, this builds the first, you know, first parts of the pipeline of the processing pipeline because we're not interested per se in NLP and tokenizing text. I mean, it's tricky, but you know, this is not the, the main core. You want to do something, something else like uh, search engines or predicting sentiment or you know, another sort of much cooler stuff than just segmenting into text, but. In order to do so, you, you need this corpus, and the corpus comes typically as a long document, or even worse, as some semi-structured, maybe HTML text and so on. So you want to really make sure that you 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 know you pre-process the text in the plain text form, so you can really work with that later on. And all these techniques we're discussing today are are important, you know, in one or the other direction, depending really on the on the source of the data and so on. But from my experience, they you will you will have you will have to use them sometime in the future if you work with some data coming out of uh, out of outside from the internet, for example. So very useful to know all these techniques. And we have some links here, so you wanna you wanna check them out. Um, the stemming. Uh, from the information retrieval book, which is freely available. It's a very nice read, by the way. It's a very, it's a very good book. Uh, it's from 2008 or 2009, but it's still, it's a really good introductory book in information retrieval. And uh, I would say of just, you know, download PyCharm, get some text you're interested in, and just play around with NLTK. You know, this is how you really. Um, start understanding the concepts and all the nuances and different stemmers and different tokenization and so on. So you will, you know, you will have the real challenges. Maybe you can scrape a site we are interested in. You know, scraping websites is a different story. You know, because nowadays lots of websites are in JavaScript and scra scraping JavaScript it's a, it's a painful experience. But you can, you know, maybe some older, just plain HTML sites you want to extract some information from them. So just scrape them and just start playing around with regular expression tokenization and maybe some data statistics over that. So it could be interesting and, you know, it's uh, sometimes it's really fun to do this. Sometimes it's not because the, the data could be super messy. So how to prepare for the next week? Um, I would say, you know, you can do all these, all these points mentioned here. I would say just play around with uh, all you, all we've seen today and, and have fun and try to understand practically as much as possible. So it was a pleasure. I'll see you in, in mid of January for the next two guest lectures. Bye bye. What? I don't know. Is it YouTube? I mean, so I'm a YouTuber. So shall I, shall I ask for, for likes or no? Okay. <laughs>